first of all, thank you so much for having us out. It's wonderful to be And we are converting it. Our story is just about storytelling once again. And being able to share uh, that space between your soul, which means your mind, your emotions, and then this sacred place that's for us all that we don't share often, but we want to yearn to be heard. But then there's another spot, secular place where we have to communicate out and how we can find that stories that are in our hearts and tell these stories, taking care of our families, taking care of our friends, taking care of our community. Uh, and this is my community. This is one of my uh, students, Reagan Davis. And my colleague, uh, Mr. Austin Crawford, head of profession at Western College. And so thank you all for allowing us to tell the journey. Let me tell you a little bit about the song that we uh, And you were hearing from the filmmaker. Uh, I was really intrigued to hear the words like a children. So I brought a challenge to my students. Uh, and I give you the same challenge. Uh, is change under So when it happens, it's locked on you. And you have to deal with it to solve it. But one of my students, Jewel, she said, this is Sandy, but I think I would, because in, in our uh, education environment, we always want to challenge one another to defend our argument. So she got, she defended her argument. She said, but it's changed really the, the resistance from integrity that's a place that's never changed. It is, but it never changed. So I want to commend each of you for being a strong conduit of change. Continue to enjoy your integrity. Okay, so for our closing session on the integration of we are going to introduce the team from uh, Arts for Everybody. Take it away. That's why you guys are standing Well, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question, right? Well, it was, again, for the integration of all of the things that we're going through. So I was watching um, uh, the project of Arts for Everybody from afar. Probably many of us were, and some of us may not have known what the project is actually about as we started to see the first like uh, social media reels come out. Um, and, I mean, because they were uh, they were spontaneous. I could tell. I was like, "Oh, Clive's doing a live reel uh, in the, in the live feed." I was like, "Okay, that's something new." And he was talking about the work, and I didn't exactly know what it was until I started to see the different communities around the country and their individual projects. And, um, and they, were in a, they were extremely innovative, very regionally specific. And, um, and I, was, I was impressed. It was, it was kind of like what Danny was talking about with that theater in Chicago. You were seeing these, these visions, these unique visions that were popping up in the regions. And uh, so I was glued to the, to the, the story that was unfolding all these different of the country, so as we were planning this closing, because I think that the, the closing was the hardest, because how do we close this? Um, uh, that, that was a journey for us to design, and then how do you close this? And then it really, it was a gift actually for us because we were seeing what y'all were doing, and and I, I had the privilege of being a good friend, being good friends with Clyde, who's always come through, and, and I'm always there for him, and so uh, I called him. And then the aspect that I didn't know was the aspect of health, which also resonates with me because belonging is health. And uh, then I said, okay, Clyde, that this project really should be the closing piece. Um, and we'd like to see how you could uh, maybe model this program for the rest of uh, the, the get participants of the symposium because it touches all of the aspects. Um, of, uh, of, of, the, of the symposium. So 
Thanks. Thanks for asking. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for the setup. Uh, that was very appropriate. Um, so, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Claude Valentin. I know many of you in the room. It's my colleague, Tom Thomas, Michael Rowe. Can we, for the tech, can we just turn the house lights up a little bit so we can move away from uh, the theater piece and we can see each other a little bit more? Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, and to our friends on HowlRound who might be you know, joining our live stream, welcome. Uh, so, uh, as David mentioned, uh, we had been in conversation, you had this uh, vision for this weekend, symposium, something immersive, something rigorous. Uh, all of us have been here for the most part over the last two days. Uh, the conversations have been beautiful, informative, educational, inspiring. Um, and as we've been here listening, knowing that we had this charge to somehow share out our work and synthesize at the same time, no small task, you know, uh, it actually started to reveal itself in terms of um, things like what Vicky Grease said about just pay artists, right, just pay us. Um, uh, health, the health of an artist is the health of the community. Um, <coughs> Being civically engaged and being a leader, recognizing your leadership and your value in your community and what that means uh, to the rest of who uh, you share a block with or a neighborhood with, neighborhood with matters, right? Um, and so, so, you know, that's what we heard and we're going to attempt to do some weaving and um, spend a little time thinking about with each other what's next because uh, the point of this isn't just to be sitting in rooms and experiencing work is to be charged and you know keep it moving, right? Um, with integrity and all those values that we heard from people like Jason and brother over here, and all of you. Uh, so uh, maybe we can um, jump to the slides now and uh, just like get into a little bit of uh, what we did. Um, And I'm going to ask Tyler uh, Thomas, our Associate Artistic Director, to really uh, kind of move us through what the inspiration around the project was. And um, we'll get into like some of our work and our goals and the mechanics of this uh, national arts and health initiative that is time-based at sunsets on June 30th, 2025. So we have roughly about eight months left. Thanks so much, Clyde. Hello, everyone. My name is Tyler Thomas. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and I have had the great joy and privilege of working with One Nation, One Project as our Associate Artistic Director for the past three years, I think. Years. We've been working on this since 2021. Um, and you can stay on this slide for just one more moment, um, which is to just to draw out the distinction. Our organization is entitled One Nation, One Project. Um, that's what we, as a sort of body, um, uh, have been working towards, and Arts for Everybody is the national campaign. Mm -hmm. So we've been working with 18 communities across the country over the past three years to develop cross-sector cross collaborations that leverage arts and culture for community well-being. And Arts for Everybody has been the way that we've communicated that work and the work of the larger arts and health field um, to the, the broader community outside of those 18 sites. So you can go to the next slide for me. So Arts for Everybody here, exactly as I've said, is a national arts and health initiative. And what we, I, I think you guys spoke about this uh, maybe at the top of day yesterday, we actually started this work as a working group ourselves. A group of artists came together and asked this question, what would happen if the arts, public health, and municipal sectors came together to heal our communities? This is 2021, it's at the height of the pandemic. And we're asking ourselves, how do we do the thing that we know is true, which is activate the essential role of artists in bringing health and healing to our communities? And we had a sense that our problems were too complex to be solved by one sector. So how can the artist and the art sector actually step in to, catal to be a catalyst for collaborations that can come around and raise community up with arts and culture at the table? And Tyler, can I Please. just add that one of our sort of uh, premises or theories around this was like, if we were approaching people with a finite project that had an endpoint, 
um, which we'll get into a little bit, that it would be easier to, to say yes to because it didn't have this open-ended commitment. So we thought about that with respect to fundraising, but also respect to the invitation. Absolutely, and that's a perfect segue to the next slide, which was our core inspiration. So Clyde Valentin up here is one of our three co-artistic directors, the other two being Lear de Bessonet and Ataki Garrett. And Lear specifically, who is newly the artistic director of Lincoln Center Theater, which is incredible, um, and she has been one of our lead artistic visionaries since the beginning. She was inspired by an event that happened in 1936 put on by the Federal Theater Project, um, which was when 18 cities and towns put on the same day, on the same play, on the same day. And that play was It Can't Happen Here, uh, which was written by Sinclair Lewis, which was essentially a parable taking on the rising threat of fascism in Europe at the time. And each of those communities adapt that work in their own local artistic and cultural vocabularies. So in um, Alabama, there was a brass band parade. In Seattle, they used the play to tackle um, uh, racism, casting the fascists as members of the KKK, or, or rather members of the KKK as fascists. In New York, they had it in three languages, Spanish, English, and Yiddish. And so we were inspired by this notion to Clyde's point of how do you create an event that can manifest uh, the particular role of the artist and of the arts to revive community, to bring community together, and to imagine together. And so we, if you go to the next slide, invited our 18 cities uh, to put on an event on the same day, on July 27th. So the work that we have been working on over the last three years actually kind of peaked <laughs> about two months ago. <laughs> July 27th of this year, us three and the other members of our team were across the country in 18 places celebrating the work of uh, two years of collaboration with our communities. You can go to the next slide. And the way that we augmented, however, this historical inspiration was bringing cross-sector collaboration to the table and an emphasis on community health. So we didn't ask everyone to make a play. We asked folks to make work that was relevant to them. And we asked them to start in partnership with their municipality and with their local health partners, health leaders. For some folks, that's a clinic. For other folks, that has been a city or county health department. Um, and then, of course, we have our artists that are at um, kind of the core of that plan. And, and one more thing on that entry point around July 27th, we also, all the sites acknowledge that it could be an end point or a beginning point. And to really like embrace and encourage their own experimentation with this opportunity. Can I say one small thing about the invitation? Uh, I'm, I'm Michael Rode, pronouns he, him, his. My role at Arts for Everybody is Civic Collaborations Director, and I'll talk about that in a couple minutes. But the, the 18 sites um, came in through two different doors. So one of our major partners is the National League of Cities, which is a service organization that represents, I think, 5,200 towns, villages, and cities around the United States. And at the very beginning, Lear, I think, in particular, knew that we had to have a partner in municipal government at the national level to be credible as we were inviting communities into this project. So we developed a partnership with the National League of Cities, and the first nine cities actually applied through the National League of Cities to be in this cohort with us. And that's you'll see the map later. The second group of nine did not come in through the National League of Cities. They came in through arts institutions or arts anchors small, not always large, who were interested in the project. So we actually got the opportunity to work with sites that had come in through the municipal door or the art store and sort of learn about how those are made for different projects and dynamics. And that's part of how we came to the 18. Absolutely. And our work with them has been to build up those cross-sector collaborations so that the work on July 27 is an opportunity to make visible those collaborations to community but also to be leveraged towards the sustainability of the work. Um, and I believe, Clyde, we're going to go to the next slide and talk a little bit about the sort of existing body of research and then how our work has augmented that research. So when Lear and I started talking about this project in uh, early 2021, it may have been January or February, uh, we had both worked on uh, Public Works. Many of you might be familiar with Public Works Dallas, through the Dallas Theater Center. And uh, there was a research component attached to that. Uh, and we used the same cultural anthropologist, Dr. Shirley Bryce Heath, uh, to sort of like track, you know, the transformation of language, you know, uh, community members going from I to we, for example, 
uh, which is a, another thing I heard at some point yesterday. And um, we had seen the sort of very real changes in real time. And we thought it was very important at the very beginning of this project to design and bake in a very robust research and evaluation process. Florida, and um, you know, initially the conversation was, "Hey, we just want to talk to you about what we're doing. Um, we have this position, director of national research and impact. We're looking to find someone to lead our research work." And uh, Jill ran away with the circus and became our national research and impact director. Um, you know, we heard yesterday even uh, sort of the impacts of the arts in our lives, civic engagement, and so on. Uh, so we wanted to be able to amplify and broaden our collective understanding of the power of the role arts, artists, and culture play in our respective communities um, by contributing to this body of work, but also transforming it narratively. Go ahead. Yeah, if I could just add to that, you know, these statistics up here, we you know taking part in the arts lowers the risk of dementia, lowers the risk of depression, offers health benefits comparable to weekly exercise for our elders. These are lenses of health, but you also mentioned David belonging. We think about racial equity as health. We think about economic health. We think about social health in terms of our connectedness. So I think the invitation for all of the sites was not only to um, the sort of geographic uh, and regional diversity, but also each site got to name what is the health need upon us in our community? What does healing look like? What's most pressing in our community too? So. They each um, selected what was the issue that they wanted to tackle in their and community. And we'll share a few of those sites. Let's go to the next slide, if you don't mind. Thank you. Uh, so these are 18 communities. Um, as Michael mentioned, we started off with nine, and I think the initial nine did not um, did not look like the usual suspects, right? The major, the only major city that was included in the first nine was Chicago but it also included Phillips County, Arkansas, and Utica, Mississippi. Um, shout out to our Roots members. And Edinburgh, Texas. And Edinburgh, Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that struck folks initially. That was also intentional. Um, something that we didn't mention with respect to the partnership with NLC was that we also were asking uh, the municipalities to truly show an investment uh, in this experimentation and project by committing American Rescue Plan Act dollars, ARPA dollars, uh, and so, so there was public resources, but there were also private resources. Money that we were raising, but also money that folks on the ground would raise and leverage from ARPA. So it was sort of this public-private initiative from the very, very beginning. Um, notice that there's a big gap in those frontier states. Uh, and you know, we're, we're, we're hindsight now in terms of 2020. Uh, Michael didn't. Michael just moved his family to Montana, so ideally Montana uh, would have been on here or something. But you know, Dallas would have been on here even. But you know, it, it happened. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, I'm already looking back and regretting some things. So let's go to the next slide. It's all learning. It's yeah, all it's all learning. learning. Yeah. Uh, so our work. These are sort of the four pillars of our work. Um, we were providing artistic and curatorial support, and we have very distinct examples of how that showed up in each place. Uh, you know, one, uh, two local artists, an arts collective called Hammer and Space, they had this vision um, to build this object that would engage communities across Phillips County, which is a deeply rural um, county in Arkansas, and they wanted to broadcast. They wanted to be able to, like, pipe out the, the stories of water and relationship to water out of this thing that they were building, uh, but they didn't want to use Starlink because, you know, Elon Musk. So we found a community radio producer, an engineer from LA, uh, who worked with this organization called the Boyle Heights Arts Conservatory, uh, and he was able to provide very real technical assistance to create uh, and identify the, 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 the mechanics, the machinery, the equipment, and then he trained them up on how to be able to introduce that element uh, to their work and the object, just as a, an example. Uh, we talked about the research and evaluation that had to be backed in. We also wanted to ensure that we did the heavy lifting on behalf of these communities. So our research team, um, all along the way, our, our, the communities that we're working with were submitting monthly evaluations, 
But those evaluations or reports were going, were happening via interviews. And then our research team would write up what we heard and then send that back to each place. And they would green light. They would say, yes, that's what we said. That's accurate. That's, that's uh, clear to me. And then you know we would uh, put that in a data repository that's also made available to each site. Clyde, can I add to that? Just to say, one of the things we know so often when we're doing the work, we're not also documenting how we're doing the work. So a part of this research and evaluation, the research component, is researching the impacts of arts participation on social cohesion and community well-being. So they're doing surveys in community at every arts activity, every arts activation. The community, the impact on the community was being researched. The evaluation piece is documenting their process, and as Clyde mentioned, we give that all back to them in the form of a data repository, so that they have their own reflections and their learnings along the way to take the future funders. All along the way, this uh, narrative networking and media strategy was happening through the cohort development process, but also through our social media, which became our principal platform. Um, and we uh, amplified certain sites through the creation of uh, storytelling techniques. We commissioned a song by John Forte that included five local artists from across various sites. Um, that then became a video. We have a podcast series that's coming out, being produced now, that will also focus on a handful of sites. Um, we launched an influencer campaign that fe featured people like Edward James Amos and Jay Ellis and several others. Uh, and then finally, we provided lots and lots of technical assistance in small and big ways. Mike, do you want to say anything about yeah. that? Yeah, I'll be real quick. So Tyler and I and the great Rebecca Martinez, who was sort of the third member of our technical assistance team. And Georgia Gempler. And Georgia Gempler from the National League of Cities. The four of us basically for the last two years have been doing uh, bi-weekly Zoom check-ins with every site. We've been doing uh, office hours, sort of opportunities to be supportive and brainstorm partners. We've been doing monthly virtual cohort gatherings of all 60 to 100 people. Um, we've been doing site visits. Tyler and I have been on the ground in many of these sites multiple times, supporting the work, often used by local partners, artists, municipal partners, and health partners, to sort of say, look, the national partner showed up, and it's gotten them into rooms for conversations with folks who have sort of paid attention to the project because of its national scale. And that's been an interesting way that they've leveraged us in different places. Uh, and, and really, the rela I mean, the relationships over the last couple of years, the number of stories we could tell are sort of countless, but we've become phone and text friends with people in all of these sites, and have ended up actually being deeply engaged in the projects and practices um, and have, I think, at times been really generative with them, and at times been in a sort of crisis response kind of phone a friend sort of presence. But it's been a really powerful part of the initiative for all of us. So, to echo what we talked about over the last couple of days, it was you know building trust very intentionally, very slowly, but also knowing that we were on a timeline. Mm -hmm. So, how do you create slowness but still adhere to a timeline, right? It was a uh, tricky balancing act for us in that regard. And in the types of rooms that we were able to be leveraged for were like sitting down with the county judge in Harlan County in Southeast Kentucky, you know, who's a, you know, a red blooded Republican, uh, but was talking about, you know, the need to deal with the opioid crisis, the need to deal with uh, some real health issues across that particular county. And, you know, we sat right next to our colleagues from Higher Ground, which are community ensemble theater company. Uh, we got into room, help folks get into rooms with like the Calvin Foundation in Kansas City, where you know uh, the leaders of arts and mentorship were able to talk about the need for multi-year funding. They're a ten-year organization. They're on the same cycle that many of us are, raising money every year. But they were like, it'd be really nice to get our first multi-year grant. Uh, they just got that. That's and I mentioned one of the room because it's not in our examples, and it feels maybe relevant. So one of our sites is um, Tucson, Arizona, and Borderlands Theater. A, a tremendous company of artists. And because of the work they were doing with us, we ended up encouraging them to get in some rooms with folks, not just at the health department, but in city government. And I, I ended up in a room with them, and Nataki Garrett, one of our core artistic directors, and Rebecca, in a room with them with a violence prevention um, program out of the housing unit of city government. And they had not met before with this theater company. And as this violence prevention program officers, the folks who work for the housing department, were describing what they were doing in 
what is determined statistically to be the most violent 10 square blocks in the city of Tucson. And so they're trying all these strategies to sort of deal with that as a city government. They're basically trying to create public engagement and listening opportunities for residents to be in more trusting relation with local government. And as they had these conversations and they described what they were creating event-wise, Mark from Borderlands and Mark Pinate, Mark Pinate, a wonderful artist, Mark started going, well, wait, it sounds like what you're trying to do is what we do through some of our workshops and performance events. And all of a sudden, the conversation started happening about the relationship between health, violence prevention, local government, and this theater company. They are now in conversations that are probably going to lead Michael, to... Michael, they actually are. They're starting in the fall. It. They are working in the public housing units. So they got the city country. money to suddenly be in this because of a conversation that happened because of this project and a new coalition that's building. It's super beautiful. Remember, Margie Lee yesterday gave the example about changing the frame, right? So that's an example of how the frame changes. Let's get to the next slide. We're yep. conscious of time. And Absolutely. We can always go down our respective rabbit holes, as you very well know. Okay. Like no, 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 you did it. I did. Um, so <laughs> our goals, uh, active collaboration. You know, one of the things we had to really work past was that we were not a fund, we were a national collaborator. And we talked about that dynamic too, right, in terms of fundraising. Oh, I don't want to get something wrong. I'm afraid, you know, to like go to the partner. And we, we had that early on. We had to remind folks. They were like, everyone else thought they were doing everything perfectly, mm -hmm. except for themselves. They're like, I'm doing everything wrong. Everybody saw it. And we were like, listen, we need to get past this. If we're going to really build trust. Can I just underline what you just said? Yes. Because I think we had to introduce that ourselves to that, to the community. want to really be intentional that that was our objective going into this project. Uh, amplifying local narratives, very, very important. We did that a variety of different ways, again, through the commissioning of our song, through the storytelling process, through the influencer campaign, and, and we also have a bevy of research briefs uh, and peer-reviewed published papers that are going to be coming that are focused on the sites, uh, and all of this is on our website. And then uh, lastly, a tree, you know, advanced health equity in certain places like Oakland, California, uh, for our partners there, uh, racial equity is health equity. They were very clear about their particular theme and what they were attempting to establish in Oakland um, as a community. So we had to stay open to that through and, and through each place. Uh, bespoken, which is uh, a, you know the word that Tyler introduced um, to our team, and uh, achieve transformation in some of the places that's happening. It's not all places, not always perfect. Uh, but where transformation is taking place, uh, we are amplifying those stories. Next slide. Edinburgh, Texas. Great. So we're going to just share a little bit about a couple of them. I'm so glad a, a few of the other ones have been mentioned. Phillips County, Borderlands in uh, Tucson, Arizona. Edinburgh, Texas. Lead artist Brisa Munoz, who's actually based out of New York City, but is from Edinburgh. That's where she grew up. Was employed as a city employee which was one, I think, one of the few examples that we had of that type of partnership. So this was a project that came through our first cohort. The project was led by the city, and then through that partnership, Brisa became an employee. And their art event was sort of twofold. One, Brisa as a community-engaged theater maker, created a community-based, community-devised, I think 65-person community theater piece um, called Despierta. And it sort of tells the story and the history of the RGV, of the Rio Grande Valley. And specifically, their intent, their goals from the beginning was to uplift belonging. Edinburgh as a place for a home for everyone who was there, and also to transcend some of the traditional and harmful narratives that happen um, that are placed on the border community. You know, Brisa talks about joy being a radical act. So she wanted to reframe, they wanted to reframe for the community the image of themselves. Um, and so that project, they premiered it, of course, on July 27th, that musical, but they also coupled that with Edinburgh is the city of festivals, as they call themselves. And so their Frida Festival is their most popular festival all year, their Frida Kahlo Festival. So they merged those two things. So they premiered the musical and then also had the Frida Fest sort of as a wraparound event on July 27th. They, they also wanted in, uh, to sort of leverage us nationally to, to sort of like reframe the narrative of being a, a, a border town. And uh, Edinburgh will be one of our podcast episodes, just as an FYI. 
Next slide, please. Chicago. This is an incredible project. The seeds of this already existed in the minds of the brilliant Maida McNeil, who is in Chicago. If anyone knows her, she's a theater artist. Shout out to Maida. Take it. Shout out to Maida. Shout out to Maida. Maida. Yeah. Amazing human being. She then worked at Chicago Parks and Rec for a while and really revolutionized the way parks work with neighborhoods, particularly around cultural centers. And then she took a job at the uh, Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events at DK's in Chicago, where she was thinking about cross-sector collaboration and what would happen if the arts started working more with health, started working more with workforce development. And a, a huge crisis in Chicago, like many places, of course, is around behavioral and mental health and the shortages of service providers and the challenges of providing services, particularly in some of our most vulnerable communities. So what Maida wanted to do was figure out a way that artists could engage in helping the city respond to that crisis. So the project that was a part of Arts for Everybody in Chicago was a pilot program that invited artists from around the city of Chicago to apply to basically get hired by the city and do two things simultaneously. One, they would go through a training program in partnership with Malcolm X Community College to learn to be a community health worker. Not instead of being an artist, but to bring that into their artistic practice. At the same time they were doing that, and I'm thinking about the conversation we started to have yesterday, at the same time they were doing that training, they were placed in a city-run mental health clinic on the south or west side in partnership with clinicians, and they were invited to design and lead cultural activities in their practice, and it was all different disciplines that they came from. And the same time they're getting the training, they're leading creative work in these neighborhood clinics with patients and with clinicians. They're partnering and figuring out what their practice can contribute to the health outcomes in these communities. It has been very successful. The clinicians are having a positive experience, Patients are having a positive experience. They're using it to help in those neighborhoods, let people know about available resources. These artists are employed. I think it's an 18-month deal to begin with, which includes salary and benefits. They're getting the training. They'll come out certified as community health workers. Again, not to change careers, but to bring that into their creative practice in the community. And it's been so successful that they're now looking at collaborating with workforce development resources, both federal and local, to enlarge this pilot. They have a goal of moving to 50 artists in the next few years. It's, it's amazing how the city is sort of responding to it. They've had transitions in mayoral leadership, which of course anytime you change administrations makes stuff complicated, but luckily this mayor's administration made a very loud commitment to mental health, so D-Case is able to continue narrating this as a contribution to that. On July 27th, they created basically what they called an Arts and Health Summit, which was a really unique event in the city because it brought municipal workers and leaders into a room with health leaders, into a room with artists. And those folks had not been in conversation publicly in this way before. So they were able to talk about the successes of the program. There was art throughout the day. There were panels. Clyde was there and on one of the panels at one point. And people talked about sort of the connections that were able to happen that day that are going to help move that work forward. Um, so it's, it's really thrilling to watch that seed through this national collaboration sort of grow and be seen more. And it's definitely one that's going to be moving forward in the city. Next slide, please. So the Bronx, uh, the Bronx, we have uh, our partner there is Urban Health Plan. They are a federally qualified community health center. Uh, are folks familiar, just with a show of hands, of that term, federally qualified community health center? Mm -hmm. Show of hands. I didn't know about, thank you, I didn't know about uh, FQ, CHCs either until we started this project. And one of the things we learned about the importance of community health centers is that they were started as part of the Johnson administration, you know, the war on poverty, and they were designed to be hyper-responsive to local communities and local community needs, right? So along with providing health care, and they exist all over the country, there's 1,900 of them, approximately, rural and urban. Uh, this is clearly an urban location. Uh, and along the way, 51% of their board must be constituted by members of the community. That's a mandate for FQCHC. Imagine 
if major arts institutions <laughs> in this country yeah. had that mandate, this amendment, or even boards of foundations had that mandate based upon who they claim to serve. Yeah, but I know this is being recorded. Um, so uh, Urban Health Plan and Paloma Hernandez in particular is incredibly inspiring. She really introduced us to the role of CHCs. Uh, so uh, she was a champion from the very beginning. Um, they have launched a social prescribing project. And I think social prescribing came up yesterday. Are folks familiar with that term, social prescribing? OK, it is an emerging, you're going to talk about this. Uh, so I'll just talk about the Bronx then. Um, so I'm going to talk about it? OK. I just give you the 30 second thing about the federal stuff. Thank you. All right. So uh, social prescribing, this is how teamwork works. Okay, right? so teamwork plays a dream work. So uh, Paloma, through this lens of CHCs, already there's a history of introducing various services. So at CHCs, there's a legal desk, there's an immigration desk, there's like a finance desk. This is just to help community members in this sort of overall um, uh, social, social determinants of health. That's right. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, so they hired a curator. They hired a producer who's very familiar with creative placemaking. At the health clinic. Working out of the health clinic. And then they started to cure. And then they aligned partners. Is Pregonas uh, a partner of, the, of um, UHP yet? Okay, so that's uh, that's something to come. Um, so uh, they are working with Casita Maria, which I'm sure you're familiar with, and a number of organizations right around their flagship clinic, which is called uh, San Juan Health Center um, in the South Bronx. Their day was glorious. They had a parade. They had a procession. They had a number of activities. You could see all these folks. Uh, our colleague, Leo de Bessonet, was there that day. Um, and what they've been doing is socializing the notion of social prescription, both for their uh, employees, so that they can have access to you know, joy and, and creativity and expression, and their clients. They serve 90,000 people uh, across the Queens, Bronx, and Central Harlem. And through our work together, uh, they are in line to receive their first NEA grant, National Endowment of the Arts, as a health uh, to, clinic. As a health clinic to expand to two other clinics. One in Elmhurst, Queens, which was one of the most decimated communities around COVID when it was raging across New York City, and the other in Central Harlem. Um, they will be part of a pilot that's getting announced very soon by the NEA, which is going to be an arts and health pilot being led by Dr. Maria Rosario Jackson. So this is the segue to the federal. Well, quite. I just want to make sure folks understand what social prescribing is, yeah. which is essentially that it's a partnership between um, an or arts organization, so a Casita Maria, for example, a health clinic, and an insurance company. And it's essentially getting arts and creativity um, referred, prescribed by your doctor and covered by insurance. Which is pretty amazing. One of the mantras is, uh, as opposed to asking the question, what's the matter with you, is what matters to you, right? So when you sit down with a doctor or a practitioner, they're not just, hopefully, this is almost antithetical to the US healthcare system, right? So this is why that it's, they have so much potential and richness and movement in this country, but already exists in the UK, it exists in Canada, about 30 some odd countries around the world is to sort of really think holistically about the human. So, and this isn't about like reducing your, you know, uh, prescription per se. This is about encouraging you to come to the doctor more, to actually take your medicine, to make you feel connected. And augmenting medicine. Right. Arts as medicine, yeah. You want me to see? Uh, I mean, the short version of David being here with you uh, this weekend, everyone, and thinking about field and the connection between wellness and arts and community work, there is a possibility that five years from now we will look back at what's happening right now in this social prescription field and we will realize that it is the most transformative thing that will have happened to arts and arts organizations in decades because there's a possibility, people are working on this now, that several years from now a doctor will be able to prescribe an arts experience for a patient, and that that will be reimbursable by insurance companies and Medicare and Medicaid. 
And there are there conversations are happening here in Dallas. Happening here in Dallas and at the federal level that literally would make billions of dollars a year in the healthcare industry available for artists and arts organizations through that prescription process and patients being able to participate and engage in the arts. It will transform the economy of the arts. Mm -hmm. And so our relationship to that and our understanding of that is crucial over the next several years. Who here consider themselves an artist educator? Just a quick show of hands. You are potentially already part of the infrastructure because you're already working in regards to a relationship with another entity, be it an education institution, a community-based organization. Um, so we have talked a lot about infrastructure with our project, social infrastructure, building new bridges and tunnels, right? Yeah. So that's part of the storytelling process for us. Um, this is major. You know, one of the things we did leading up to July 27th was we co-hosted uh, an event at the New York Federal Reserve, Bank, right? And, uh, you know, I think initially we're like, why the heck are we doing something with the New York Federal Reserve Bank? And most folks don't know this, but in addition to printing money and, you know, setting financial regulatory processes and policies, regulations, right, they um, are charged with uh, some real community engagement and development efforts. Uh, when a bank gets their hand caught in the cookie jar and they have to write a fine, for 200, 300, 500 million dollars, that money goes to the New York Fed, and then the New York Fed distributes that to entities called community development fund investors, right? Um, David Erickson, who's a senior vice president at the New York Federal Reserve, who's our colleague, who's a champion of this work, um, is uh, drafting a paper right now. There's a major event happening at the New York Fed on November 14th, which we will be at. Um, and we were telling our story about what was coming July 27th, but we were also talking to the economists that work out of the New York Fed. So we understood who the audience was. And you know, we were making a case for this because the healthcare sector alone in this country is a $4.5 trillion sector. Most of that goes to emergency services, dealing with chronic illnesses, so you're already sick, right? and pharmaceutical companies because you're being prescribed a pill, right? Those are for-profit industries. So peeling some of that off and beginning to shift again the frame and to think more broadly about where and how we support our work on a local level and the value we bring to the table means that those resources have to reach us as well. And that's part of the case-making and advocacy we're doing. Let's go to the next slide. So we talked a lot during uh, yesterday about complex collaborations. Michael mentioned the National League of Cities. We wanted to take a moment to just sort of like spend time on this slide to sort of um, talk about how we gathered people and how we were able to realize this scale so quickly because we had a lot of naysayers at the very beginning. It was like, just work with six sites. You can go deeper. You know, don't go past nine. The National League of Cities, which runs cohorts all the time, Right? They're in the business of cohorts uh, for municipal leaders. We're like, we never do a cohort more than six. Right? And we were like, no, it has to be nine because we need to get to 18 because our inspiration is a federal theater project. Right? So we were fixed on this number. And they were like, oh, but we, you know, it's going to be hard to manage. And we were like, no, 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 we're going to do this. Yes, 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 it'll be hard to manage. Yes, yes, but... yes. Also, they were like, we never have a rural community like Utica, Mississippi and a population of 900 in a cohort with a major city like Chicago. That doesn't work. And we were like, you don't know that because it's artists collaborating with each other, right? Maida McNeil not only works for DKs, but she is a theater man, right? So, you know, we were like uh, kind of countering even our own partners through this process, but the NLC was an important route. Adventureland. Uh, who are the producers of Hamilton, and In the Heights, and Avenue Q, and uh, uh, Rent, thank you. Uh, you know, it was important to be able to work with folks who were not intimidated by scale and ambition, right? So even though they didn't know anything, and we had meetings with Jeffrey Seller about like, you know, what community engagement looks like, right? Because all he could think about was community theater. And we know that oftentimes community theater has a connotation 
in the field that might be negative, right? So we had to do that education, but we needed to be in space with the folks who weren't intimidated by the numbers, the budget, and again, the scale of what our vision was. Um, Soze is an influencer agency. They worked with us to do the photo shoot uh, with all the celebrities to help amplify our work. Uh, we have a number of um, uh, PR agencies. CSI, led by Roger Chauvinier, is a leader in the public health sector. He has an appointment at John Hopkins. He's highly knowledgeable, and he's been an asset to several of our communities as they've attempted to create those relationships and inroads with uh, health, the health sector in particular. And then finally, the Center for Arts and Medicine as a, a legit center that's been around for 30 years that has been studying and tracking you know, the impact of arts in health. Uh, so we had our own series and bevy of highly complex collaborations and partners uh, to help realize this project. In addition to our team, which I think might be the next slide. Um, can we go to the next slide? So this is about half our team. Uh, you can see me and myself, Nataki, Michael, Tyler, Jill. Uh, what I really want to point out is that even on the research side, including Georgia Gambler from the National League of Cities, we're all practicing artists in some way, shape, or form, some discipline, um, in addition to sort of like this work. Uh, I would say 80% of this group here are theater makers, but we weren't making theater. One of our sort of uh, theory of change, if you will, is that theater makers are predisposed to a level of collaboration that sometimes other, dis other disciplines are not, right? Um, and so we brought that skill, we think, to the table to facilitate and enable this uh, very ambitious project to be realized. Um, and like I said, this is not theory. July 27th happened, you know? Um, it's now behind us. So let's move on to the next slide. What's next? Tyler? Yeah, what I'll do is maybe blaze through these because I think we want to give folks some time to ask questions and to be in dialogue with each other. And I think we're looking at 15 minutes. Yeah, 15 minutes. So a little of this has already been mentioned. If you can go to the next slide, um, actually go back to really quickly um, to two slides before. Just want to shout out our national photographer, Scout Tufang Shen, who, um, if you go to the next slide, is the amazing woman who's been taking all of these yeah, photos. She so. was it's Barack so Obama's beautiful. campaign photographer, so she did the whole book, <laughs> Barack Obama's book, and so all of these images have been hers. She's outrageous in this. She took in Seattle. And, yeah, this was so Seattle. It's so good. Yeah. Okay. Wingland Museum collaboration. Yeah. That's right. Yes. Um, okay, so you can go to the next slide for me. Thank you so much. And we've referenced a few of these. We have some briefs in our papers and our final reports coming out. Our podcast series, continued amplification, and at the very end, we're going to talk to about a capstone event that we are having here in Dallas in February, where all of our 18 communities will come for the first and probably only time together in person. You can go to the next slide for us. Um, these are some. If you go to the next slide, this is Oakland. Shout out. Um, uh, who's the, the sister was here earlier, a poet, but she had this poem at the day one. You know, this is a uh, thank you. Uh, this is a um, a moment. This is more than a moment, it's a movement. Um, you know, we talked about uh, the Hamilton line, right? Uh, and, and we have we've often been talking about that the day is a moment towards a much larger movement. And hopefully you're getting a sense that this is very much a trend that is growing in our field. It is truly a movement on various levels. Absolutely. I think in many ways there's like an X and Y axis. There's the ongoing work, there's the momentum building, and then there are the, on the Y, there's the moments that change the trajectory of that ongoing work. I want to encourage you to uh, pick up your phones and take our one minute survey, which is on this QR code right here. Uh, one of the things we did with respect to the research and impact work was, you know, we uh, conducted uh, two principal surveys. One uh, with our site specifically that's very uh, in depth around our theory of change question, which is how can arts participation transform uh, community health, well being, and social cohesion, right? So that's, uh, that's time based and sequenced and you know, had to be IRB approved and all those things. And then this survey is a one minute survey just on artistic par participation. The thing we did, we commissioned two visual artists from uh, the Bay Area. Uh, through a partner at Stanford University, Deborah Cullinan, um, to artify a very researchy survey, right? So there are icons, and you know they hire illustrators, 
Uh, the other thing we're doing with this um, coding, because this is a piece of tech now, it is a web-based application. It works on your phone, it works on an iPad. We had to think about access and making the surveys available to folks. Uh, is that it will now live at the Center for Arts and Medicine, and for any researcher who wants to take this code and invert it for their own research papers or uh, purposes, that will be made available to them. So it's very, you know, shout out to HowlRound, very inspired by this idea of a commons-based practice. So this is tech we commissioned, um, you know, that we produced and we put out into the world to facilitate our own project, but will be available in perpetuity, hopefully, you know, for those who want to continue. Um, arts-driven based research. Uh, next slide, Tyler. These are just a couple ways we commissioned John, artist John Forte to write an anthem. If you visit our website, you'll see all of this information, artsforeverybody.org. You can go to the next slide for us. Michael? Yeah, real quick, so if, if you're hearing us talk about this project and you're interested, uh, not just in Arts for Everybody, but sort of in this movement that's happening around how artists are working in community and health fields. Uh, Springboard for the Arts is an organization in the Twin Cities, in St. Paul, Minnesota. Amazing organization. I collaborated with them very early in the pandemic on something called Art Train, which is a free for artists two-hour online workshop that we give regularly, once or twice a month. Uh, and it basically is looking at the practices around community collaboration and cross-sector collaboration. For many of you here, you don't need a workshop in that. But one of the things that we spend time on is looking at how artists in that space can be doing advocacy and coalition building in their community, and in particular, looking for resources, looking for money outside the traditional arts funding streams. The other thing on here, the long game federal funding, also at Springboard, the Art Train folks, we collaborated with the NEA, the Department of Transportation, and other federal government agencies to build this webinar that now just lives online. It's full of short videos and links to folks from different national agencies talking about how they are starting to fund artists for different kinds of community development work. That is a really good resource. Again, it's free, it's at the site, and you can sort of pick through it and go, oh, I want to watch the Department of Transportation for a few minutes, talk about their grants. Oh, I want to sort of understand how the NEA is doing more health work now. That's in there, plus the free sign up for Art Train. So that's a resource if any of that is interesting to you. Thank you. Take it to the next slide. Which slide? You can kick us off. Yes, yeah, so please save the date for our fellow Dallasites and North Texas residents. Uh, we are coming to Dallas. Uh, we had three cities in the middle of the country that we can consider two of site partners, Chicago. No offense to our Chicago friends, but we know it's going to be very cold in February in Chicago. Uh, Kansas City, we know it's going to be very cold in Kansas City. Also, as much as we love Kansas City. So, uh, Dallas, even though it wasn't a site, it will be a site. It will be the 19th site, we certainly hope. Uh, where we'll gather with our colleagues uh, across 18 cities and towns, um, where we're going to share art. We're going to have a group exhibition that includes Scout. Scouts photos and several of the other visual artists so people can see themselves and each other in what we achieved as a community. Uh, we're going to have a night of theater, uh, hopefully here in this building, um, and a night of music. Because there were several musicians making movies out of Kansas City. Vincent Diallo from the Inner City Muslim Action Network, the Living Waters Gospel Choir from Phillips County, Arkansas. Uh, so it's going to be a night of celebration and music. So it's art festival, talking heads. You know, uh, we're planning to partner with the NEA and Americans for the Arts and several others on one key day. But part of it is about amplifying our learning and again, propelling this movement. So for those of y'all who are here, continue to expand your network by showing up to this. And it will be affordable and accessible. And our friend Tamitha already has a question and it gets to the point of like, do you have any questions? So Tamitha, what's your question? We need you on the mic. Just uh, recently, I was in a Zoom call with a person. It was it was collective of uh, Pleasant Grove community Zoom call with a person from the county who was doing some health work around sex education and and hoping to um, decrease uh, you know uh, infant deaths and uh, maternal deaths. 
And they asked for a partnership, like if we can connect them to something. But my concern was, I, I wanted to connect her to an organization. But I said, will you be paying this organization to share their institutional knowledge that they've been working on for the last 10 years? It's a black uh, woman-owned you know, nonprofit. And basically what they were saying, no, no, we just want to take their connections and their work, basically, and utilize it because it's for the benefit of the people. And so I'm wondering, and, in, and so I asked the question, and then I didn't say anything else because I knew my I didn't connect her. And that, so sometimes in spaces like that, I'm like, what is the language I need to say so I don't sound like a jerk, but also say I cannot do that in good faith and in good conscience. So anyway. Yes. Uh, this is, yeah, I mean, I, I want to encourage you, this is a framed question. Yeah, to follow the impulse that you had, which was, I will not connect them without a conversation about resources. And I feel confident in advocating for the fact that resources are absolutely appropriate and the thing to do with integrity in that moment if they want to partner with a community organization with, as you said, the history and knowledge and practices that could benefit them. I think we have to, we have to say out loud exactly what you just said. And we have to say it to the folks who have the resources and think that everyone should do the thing they want because of course we're all trying to help everyone all the time. The needs of community organizations and individual artists are real and uh, absolutely deserve compensation. And I think when you are asked a question like that, the advocacy that in your heart you wanted to do, I think is super appropriate and actually necessary for them to hear. I want to say we spoke to a lot of people that we didn't work with because we weren't valued too much. Yes, thank you. I'm Gina Weber. Um, I want to thank you for that information. It's awesome. I think what I was thinking about it is some of us have been doing some of that and didn't know we were doing some of that. So I want to give a shout out to a couple of theaters I work with, which is Prism Movement Theater. We do yoga and see here centers. It's funded by the city of Dallas through Art Activate. And so that's like an awesome thing we do. Uh, some of you know Lucila Roca, who's a local actress, takes care of that. And then uh, Art Stillery works with um, Wesley Ranking uh, uh, Older American Senior Center or Center. And we use um, the seniors work with us on theater production. Or they put on shows or they uh, give us advice. I mean, we use them as another arm of a theater making. And then lastly, I didn't know I was do doing that because I used to work at the Environmental Protection Agency and we commissioned and participated and wrote a play about environmental justice and we, and, and we took it around other agencies to educate the staff about what environmental justice was. And, and now you framed it so beautifully that that then it makes you wonder, well, what else can we do? <laughs> bingo, bingo. And that's, I thank you for saying that, Gina, because it was very important for us to acknowledge whenever we started speaking to someone, uh, be it our native brothers and sisters uh, in Hawaii, right? Uh, or uh, folks like Maida McNeil in Chicago, that this work has already happened. We have artists and assets, which is a word that, again, Margie Reese used yesterday, already in our communities. Um, Francis Lucerna from El Puente in the south side of Williamsburg, which is where I'm from in Brooklyn, um, has been doing this work alongside countless elders and multi-generations for 40 plus years, right? Folks owe us a lot of money. <laughs> question, question, question. So thank you so much. I appreciate the passion that's coming through and this has really helped resolve something for me in terms of arts and community. I'm an arts administrator in my past experience. I work in healthcare now and in, in, engaged in community development. So, it, and my dilemma has been sometimes arts and community are kind of one dimensional, right? We come in and we do an activity and we hope that there's a takeaway even for one person. But how do you continue to deepen that relationship where then you're 
getting artists to become certified healthcare workers or you know or opening the eyes of, of people in, to make ch transformative change so this has been very um just very like uh it's hopeful right <laughs> so my questions are to you i work in healthcare. i'm a nationally certified wellness coach currently you can't get a prescription to talk with a nationally certified wellness coach and have it cause and um, have it be covered by insurance. So I'm just wondering, one, are you guys looking at? We either have to break the nut or we have to learn how to work in the nut. And the nut wants you to have some sort of certification in the clinical field. So I'm hoping that you guys are thinking about how do we make our artist recognized by the insurance. Um, industry so that we do get to that point where arts experience can get covered and funded. One. Two, I love this um, thing about Edinburgh, Texas and how somebody ended up being employed by the city. I'm just curious if they were it was in the arts agency or if there was not an arts agency. There is one. Okay. That's awesome. Thank you very much. So to your point about uh, insurance provisions and, and moving that needle from a sort of policy regulatory perspective, that is beginning to happen in some places, right? So there are case studies, there's research attached to that. The other work that uh, the Center for Arts and Medicine is doing is in partnership with the NEA around surveying the social prescribing programs is about, um, I don't know, 20, 20 some odd, it's growing now, oh, pilots happening around the country, so they're tracking that. And, and, and I'll say this too, uh, Massachusetts, uh, which produced a great study called uh, Arts on Prescription. It's a study you can download, right? Um, through, uh, who's our colleague over there? Uh, Michael Bobbitt. Michael Bobbitt, right? Who underwrote it with state dollars, state arts dollars first. They issued about a thousand prescriptions initially. They had just aligned with a major national insurance provider to start underwriting additional social prescription based upon that initial pilot. So the cracks in the dam are coming. Um, and then it's also part of the work that the New York Federal Reserve is focused on in terms of you know beginning to push these sectors. Uh, because it's a capitalist institution, they use capitalist language. So it's uh, identifying the missing markets. <laughs> That's well, the if I could speak to the second part of that question, which is just yeah, to we'll say. Go to over. Definitely. Uh, Brisa okay. Munoz, the artist, was employed by Edinburgh's Department of Library and Cultural Arts. And they had robust arts programming, of course, they were the arts agency, but they didn't have arts and wellness programming. And as Michelle Ward, who was one of the city officials, said, um, it's been a transformative thing for their community because now the community wants arts as a wellness behavior, as wellness activity. And in her words, she said, the cat is out of the bag. And the bag will have nine lives. So we're excited for more. Olga, you might be yeah. our last word. So it, it, it piggybacks on, on the comment that you just made, which is the what really has captured my imagination in all of the all of the uh, presentation that you made is this idea of a prescription uh, prescribing the arts as a health um, solution, let's say, and that could absolutely transform the lives uh, and, and well-being of the artists in terms of fiscal, you know, financial um, uh, dependency. Uh, a real, you know, uh, change is a bellwether change, right? So that, I just, I want to know more about that and how we can help. And then the second part that I wanted to mention is the National Latinx Theater Initiative has 52 grantees, most of them working really deep into communities, right? Some of them uh, solely in Spanish, some of them bilingual, some of them uh, primarily in English. We did a survey with them and counting in-person contact and online contact, they serve 1.3 million people in the United States and Puerto Rico. So I want to know how we can um, make this information known to them because many of these organizations are really isolated. And so being able to use 
those theaters that are in those communities have another entry point for the work that you're doing, I think, could be, and we do everything uh, in English and in Spanish. And so, again, being able to use that as a conduit, which is different than your 18 cities, but another distribution mechanism, if you will, I would love to talk to you guys about that. Gladly make that happen. Um, absolutely, 110%. And these resources, many of what we talked about today is available on the website. Let's go to the last slide. I know y'all have a lot of questions, um, and we were afraid of this. We had a whole <laughs> exercise that we were going to do related to the Four Corners uh, to kind of end this LTC style a little bit. Uh, but we are a time, y'all, and we want to respect the time of our colleagues. I'm sorry. I, I, uh, I wish we had uh, a full hour and 15 minutes, but it's okay. Uh, we're going to be around. We can talk afterwards. And with the video. Uh, we do not have, you can go online for the video. I'm sorry, we didn't have time for that either. Um, so we just want to bring up uh, our friend, David Lasano. Thank you for the invitation and trusting us, wrapping this time and space uh, with you all. And really thank you for the information and your continued work. I think the question you have to ask yourselves is what do you do coming out of this, uh, this extraordinary day and a half? Um, how do you stay connected to the people who've inspired you? And how do you go deeper into those networks? Let's for answer, yourselves. Let's answer those questions, actually. Just real quick. What's the first question? Uh, I didn't say the first one. Yeah, what do you say? How do you say this word for? Who wants to say camera? Wait, I'm going to ask the question. Oh, oh well, no, we're going we're gonna to roll forward. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the first question was, did you have any examples of social prescribing oh, that are... Wait, wait, wait. So, so, so what are you taking with you? Oh, so, what am I taking with me? Um, energy. That's good. Energy because I've, I've been depleted. Yes. Okay. Who else can answer? We charge that battery, sister. We need you. Who else can answer what you're taking with you? Now I understand. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Animo. Animo. Community. 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 Momentum. Momentum. Health. He health. What did you say? Health. Health. Great. Resource. Language. Once I read more. Resources. Collaboration. Re resources. Collaboration. Reciprocity. Reciprocity. A wealth of knowledge. A wealth of knowledge. New friends. New friends. And uh, and, and what what are you what are you looking to do? Any ideas? Any thoughts? Even if it's just a seed. Serve. Serve. I woke up with this idea and you solidified it. But that if I were to do pleasant group open mic again, I could not do it without a mental health worker present mm. because I didn't yes. have the capacity to address. Me. I've been reluctant to start it again because I, I don't know that I have the capacity to address what comes into an open mic sometimes. Mm. So now I feel uh, validated, edified. Great. What, anything else you may do? Expand. Expand. Implement. Implement. Collaborate. Collaborate. Engage in rural community. Engage in yes. rural community. Nice. Okay. Well, this is wonderful. That was our debrief for the symposium. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David. We're going to transition, and we're going to hear from Lyric J, uh, Frederick Sanders, and then from Lyric J. Thank you so much. We'll be right back. The lyric is, because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadows thou leave, I will rejoice.
I want to thank you all for the commitment and the drive to go through this journey with us. It's been quite a journey. Uh, a lot to take with us. A lot of great connections. It's been incredible. This is a dream come true for me um, to bring people together from uh, around the country and uh, around uh, Latin America to convene with us here in Dallas to see the great things that we're doing and the great people. So I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, Academy Theater staff. This could not be done without Academy staff. Our technical team has just been going around. And of course, uh, our marketing and uh, our front of house team are also working long hours. So extraordinary. All of the participants, all of the presenters, and all the generosity and the time that you took and to share all of this material and, and, and yourselves. That's really what we're doing, sharing ourselves. So I, I, uh, I can't thank you all enough. And since I can't thank you enough, uh, I'm going to pass the mic to a poet. <laughs> Eric J. will close Woo! out the symposium. Even though um, we have not met each other, I have family members that I've never met, but they're still family. And uh, you know, we're all friends here today. And with that being said, hello, family. God always uses a David to fight a Goliath, one that's quiet, one that will riot. Allowing the invisible to be seen, the one without voices to be heard. Each performance a reflection, a mirror to the soul. In this sacred space, broken spirits become whole. Having a place to share our gift with the world. Each art a refuge in every dance, in every word we share. You see our joy, you see our pain, and we see that you care. They say you don't have to go to church to give your testimony and the evidence is on this stage. And the stage is more than wood and light. It is a bridge to what we can be free. God always uses a David that carries a slingshot and three stones of faith, vision, and advocacy, fighting to bridge the gap, the gap internationally to sustain the artist. Over 20 years ago, the ground was broken, the seeds were planted, and this is the harvest. A safe space for networking and building life connections, where we use healing and reconciliation to help you, I'm sorry, to help us navigate the wrong to the right. Focusing on mental and physical health to restore abundant life. We no longer want to survive, we want to live, grow together and heal. Because creativity is not just a passion, it is a profession that restores. It opens up our heart, our veins, our pores. God always uses a David ready to face a Goliath on the way. Obstacles, disappointments, heartbreaks. But David doesn't sway. From loading his slingshot to keep the arts alive, creating a world where archers of all nationalities can thrive, building sustainable practices with long-term solutions. They say, if you say it three times, it will appear. Revolution, revolution, revolution. And his fight at this beloved theater continues. Our fight continues because we all have a David in us. Every artist, everyone in the audience, we all have a Goliath to fight. For David is a spirit, so he does not walk by sight. He 
Imagine a world where we only believe what we see, how distracting that would be when facing Goliath in our personal, li personal lives, even in our calling. Imagine the story. I'm talking to the David and every one of us. Face your giant. Your story is not over. There are lives connected to yours. So few opportunities, so few doors. Remember the David within you. You are not alone. Every voice matters. Every story counts. Nosotros somos uno. And in unity we find strength. Don't focus on the size of your Goliath. When it's time for you to aim and hit, because he is so big, but so big you can't miss. Don't live the David in all of us. Thank you. Stay in touch. Maybe we'll see you next year. Yeah. <laughs>